All right. Okay, I think we're live. Hey, everyone. Happy Sunday. Hope everyone's well. Thanks for coming in. Uh, let me just throw up the, where am I here? Link to Facebook Live in case there's any issues with audio video. Um, if you're on Facebook, welcome. You can chat on Facebook. I'm not, uh, I'm not watching that as carefully. Gary will be. Uh, but if you want to log into Crowdcast, you can just come and go as you please. <laughs> um, okay, so I think everything's set up. If you do have any issues with um, audio or video in Crowdcast, the first thing to try is to try to refresh your browser, see if that fixes it. Uh, and if not, switch over to Facebook. And generally, um, it's Facebook, so they're more aggressive about keeping uh, uh, a persistent connection on the video and then streaming it out to everyone. All right, so um, hope everyone is uh, healthy and safe uh, and doing well. And uh, we'll just get started. And I wanna say, uh, as I say every Sunday, that I am uh, thankful, I appreciate you, and I'm honored to be with you uh, in this time of sensitivity, of uncertainty, and I look forward to sharing time with you in our sacred space uh, together today. What we'll do today is, um, I will set sacred space. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, a kind of more nerdy topic uh, this week. Uh, I guess every week's nerdy, but uh, this week we will talk about midlife uh, crisis slash initiation and in the context, larger context of the three phases of life. Uh, and there's a whole little uh, thing that I do when I talk about the three phases of life. Um, I'll try to get through that uh, quickly so that we can get to Gowry, who will then give us a story snippet that she has selected uh, to help do the mythopoetic illustration of, uh, of midlife initiation, which um, uh, when she shared it with me, as usual, I was like, what are you talking about? And then five seconds later, it hit me. And I was like, of course, obviously, that's the story to tell. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and then we'll close sacred space uh, I expect that people will have questions coming out of when we talk about the three phases of life. It, it's it's a very um, uh, it tends to be a very kind of useful and calibrating perspective, uh, but also a little bit pr provocative in some ways. And we'll uh, we'll probably fire up some questions. And I welcome you to post those questions. Maybe next session we'll do a, a session dedicated to Q and A. Okay, so we will get started. Um, and I'll just say that we will now uh, begin to set sacred space. And we'll begin by declaring what we're trying to do here, which is we would like to together uh, create a space which is devoid of fear, threat, and control for us to open to higher guidance from within our own selves, however we define higher guidance, um, from intuition, from divinity, from however you, you choose to do that. But the point here is to create that safe sanctuary space for all of us together and supporting each other to relax and surrender with no danger or threat uh, so that we can partake of the emotional nourishment, the spiritual nourishment uh, that comes from being in sacred space together as a group. And in opening sacred space today, I'm proposing that we follow the four presidium principles of sacred space. The first is confidentiality. What uh, is said in sacred space stays in sacred space. Now we're online, uh, so obviously we can't keep things confidential. Uh, but what we can do is when you, if you would like to maintain confidentiality, before you chat or post a question, uh, you just go into Crowdcast, um, hard to do it on Facebook. So you just come into Crowdcast, edit your profile and change your username to Mickey Mouse or you know Harry Potter or whatever. And then, um, uh, and then you can post your question uh, anonymously. And that's how we'll do uh, confidentiality. The second principle is no threat, no controlling, no fixing, no tough love. Uh, no intervening for your own good, right? Uh, what we're doing here in this hour or two every week is specifically, explicitly holding space for each other uh, to be afraid, 
to be anxious, to be happy, to be relaxed, to be pissed off, right? To be okay with that, however we are, and hold space for you just however you are. And if you transform and change in that space, that's fine. But if you don't, that's fine too. Without coming in and trying to control or fix or heal you or change your mind or bring you to a breakthrough or transformation, that's not what we're doing here. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But in as much as someone is coming in trying to control you, even with good intentions, uh, that's profane space. That's not sacred space. And there's nothing wrong with profane space. It's just, you know, like, like there's nothing wrong with not being in the men's room, uh, bathroom, right? Uh, but while we're in the bathroom, there are certain codes we, you know, sort of follow. And once we're not in the bathroom, uh, things are different. <laughs> so that was a, that was a weird analogy, but, um, but basically the idea is there's nothing wrong with trying to help someone or tough love or recommendations or whatever, uh, but that's in profane space. And when we're in sacred space, we don't do that. We can wait till we're out in profane space and then do that again. Uh, but here we're here to hold space for each other. That's the second principle. The third principle is related, uh, which is no commerce, right? So uh, of course, uh, you know, nothing may be sold or recommended or suggested, whether it's for pay or for free. If I say, oh, I've had that same problem. There's a great book you should read. We don't do that in sacred space either. Uh, because the implication is, if you don't read this book, if you don't at least consider it, you may lose out on an opportunity to like get healed or feel better or whatever. And there's an implied threat there, right? There's an implied threat there. However soft, however well-meaning, there's an implied threat there. Uh, and we don't do that in sacred space. We try to keep it as clean as possible so that we can gorge on the pure spring water, right, of emotional and spiritual nourishment that we get only in sacred space. Um, and then outside, we can make our book recommendations uh, again if we want. So we're here for your energy, not for the things you bring. We're here for what you are, not for what you provide. Not for your utility, not for your utility, but for your presence. And then the fourth principle is no expectation of participation. So there's no pressure to do anything. Again, the nourishment comes from held space and your presence and attention from what you are, not from you do, not from what you do or uh, provide. Um, and all of us together uh, will, will amplify that. Uh, so you just come and go as you please. Uh, you can be watching and you can be on your phone. You can leave, you can come back. All, any of that's okay. Uh, just when you're here, make sure you're, you're continuing to hold space uh, for everyone else. And if you're just not chatting or doing anything, that's fine too. So this is what I propose. Uh, so uh, in the next few moments, we will be stepping into this sacred space as defined together. And if you are not okay with that, that's totally cool. We will pause now here to give you a moment to withdraw from the group. Uh, and again, there's no fear, threat, or control to get you to stay in sacred space with us. Come and go as you please. Uh, just giving you a heads up. This is the space we're about to move into. And if you're not okay with that, we'll give you a moment to withdraw from the group. And then we'll come and you know hang out with you in profane space later too. Okay. So I'll just give you all a moment to dial that in and make your choice. Okay. Uh, let me make sure Facebook is still streaming. Okay, looking good. All right, so uh, for now, for the rest of us, we will now move together into sacred space. Uh, confidentiality, no fear, threat, or control, no commerce, no expectation of participation. Okay. Um, and so now uh, we will get to our main topic for the week, which is uh, quote unquote midlife crisis or midlife initiation and the three phases of life. So uh, in our last session, we talked about the sacred masculine and the initiation from the phase of on just the masculine side from boyhood to manhood, boyhood to manhood. Uh, and as a result of that talk, there was a lot of interest from people on the overall topic of initiation uh, on the overall phases of life from like manhood uh, to kinghood or womanhood to queenhood, uh, and then even beyond that. Is there anything beyond that? Um, <clears throat> and so uh, with all that interest, I, I had mentioned it's just scratching the surface of a very large topic. In this session, I wanna go maybe a little bit deeper into it and just kind of give you a survey, kind of just, you know, 
skirting the treetops of the topic um, and do a little bit of a talk on the overall phases of life and a little bit about the transformations we go through when we step through the different phases of life. So as an extra little show and tell this week, uh, what am I doing here? Okay. I'm going to share some slides that I gave in a parenting talk several years ago in person. Uh, and uh, you may have a question later about why I was talking about all this during a parenting talk, but that's, we'll leave that for later. And hopefully you can see my screen. Can you all see my screen? You should see a screen with, okay, three phases of life. Okay, so let me just kind of step through some of these slides really quickly. So here we're talking about three phases of life. Uh, early life, midlife, and later life. Now, there are many different systems. Um, uh, so there's the Hindu system uh, where we talk about, you know, the three or four phases of life. There is the um, uh, Nietzsche had a great motif around this. Uh, Dante, I think, had like seven phases, not three, uh, you know, because he's Dante, right? <laughs> and there are many different ways of, of looking at this. So to keep things simple, we'll treat this as more of a, an arty, preside, kind of generic way of looking at it, just to step through the kind of physics and give you a, a bit of a, a lens, if you will, for looking at uh, the arc of a life, right, over the arc of a person's experience over the entire arc of a, of a, of a life. So early, mid, later, okay, pretty simple. And what I wanna do is I just wanna make some small comments about each phase. Uh, and this will be heavily biased around the concepts that I teach and talk about uh, when I teach healing, when I teach bliss, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's also, um, so I'll use a little bit of vocabulary from healing. Uh, I don't think it'll be too much if you haven't uh, uh, done that kind of work with me. Um, but also it is, uh, uh, I guess I should say, a perspective informed by my experiences working with the with the, the thousands of people I've worked with uh, in healing and bliss over the years. So uh, it is from, you know, kind of my observation, um, but it's not authoritative. It's just kind of my anecdotal observation from you know, a lot of people I've worked with, but even those are like a self-selected skew. So what I mean to say here is don't take this as like authoritative or absolute or scientific. Um, something doesn't have to be scientific uh, to have an effect on you and to bring you benefit and bring you to deeper insight within your own self. Okay. Uh, so this is just some stuff I've seen. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So in the first phase, uh, we'll talk about, you know, the, the early, early phase here. Uh, early life, youth, early adulthood. Uh, and typically what happens in this phase is you are handed a kind of mask to wear. All right, so you're five or six years old, and they say, all right, little boy, all right, little girl. Now, uh, we want you to put this on uh, or else. <laughs> put this thing on or else. Uh, and you, you, you take this mask, and, you know, you turn it over. And if you're a girl, typically, typically, across the top of the mask, there is written a headline, the good girl, the good girl. Um, and if you're a boy, you turn it over, and like, what is this thing? And across the top of the boy's mask is... Uh, typically the strong, competent boy. Uh, the implication there being that if you're strong and competent, maybe we don't need you to be good all the time. Wink, wink, right? Um, but regardless, whether it fits you or not, whether you want to or not, this mask, it comes with a moral code. It comes with expectations of how you will speak and how you will behave. Even a script of what you are supposed to say in very specific situations. Um, you know, if you're a girl and someone says, I'm having a really bad day, the expectation obviously is to say, is to be nurturing and to say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that or express some kind of empathy. Uh, the expectation is that a good girl will not say, oh, well, too bad for you. I had a great day, right? <laughs> Even though that's what you may genuinely, genuinely be feeling. Uh, boys, uh, for men, right, especially if you're uh, an American man, right, if someone walks up to you, another guy and says, how are you doing? Right, doesn't matter what your life is actually is actually happening in your life. You could have just lost a family member. You could have just been fired. 
instant expected counter script is, I'm doing great. How are you doing? Or how's it hanging, right? It's, I'm doing great. How are you? And the expected reply is, I'm doing great. How are you? Right? And that is the strong, competent uh, boy slash man. We're always fine. Everything's great. Everything's smile, smile on the male and female side. And then if we're meeting because, you know, you know, I'm in the middle of a nasty divorce and I'm thinking about hurting myself and we're meeting for drinks. And after maybe like the fifth beer, I'll actually the masks will come off and I'll tell you what's actually going on with me. Right. But it, it, it typically will take that much of, you know, liquid courage, some form of courage and intimacy to be able to take those masks off in a kind of sacred space, actually, with your closest friends. Um, but even then, you know, who knows? Who knows? Um, and then, of course, there is a code of enforcement. If you don't act the part of the good girl, there are certain repercussions. If you don't act the, the role of the strong, competent boy, there are repercussions uh, as well. Um, and so the idea here is that the mask is put on you. You put it on typically more out of fear. Right. You're like, well, I don't really want to be an investment banker. I don't really want to go to Harvard, uh, but I know I'm going to disappoint like countless generations of my family, apparently, if I don't do that. <laughs> so I guess I'll put the mask on and I'll wear it happily and I'll just get on with it. Right. I'll get on. I'll try to meet the expectations of the mask that has been put on. me. Um, an initiation. Right. Uh, part of initiation is you are handed your mask and you learn how to put it on. And if there are parts that don't fit, you learn how to either attempt to cut them off or stuff them down. Right. And in the healing context, when we teach healing, when we talk about healing. These parts that have been stuffed down and cut away are the parts that then typically in later life. Uh, but to me, you know, the, 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 the million dollar question is, is it better if you recover those pieces sooner? Right. And the reason I give a talk like this in the context of uh, a group of, you know, a couple hundred parents up here in Northern California in the middle of progressive Silicon Valley. Right. The million dollar question is for your 13 year old. Right. Is it OK to sort of help them take the mask off at 13, not 35, not 65 um, and help them follow their bliss earlier rather than later? Is that OK? Are there any issues with doing that? Um, and it was a, you know, it's always a very interesting conversation. So that's the first phase. That's early life. Um, there's a whole three day conference we can do just on the early life. And I will, I'll spare you that uh, today. I'll spare you that. Okay. So that's the first phase. The second phase we're talking about midlife. Uh, and we won't put ages here, right? But midlife, well, midlife typically is where people start finding someone like me, right? Uh, so probably thir early 30s onward, right, you could say, uh, is what I've observed. So midlife, uh, 30, 40, 50, what have you, it's different for everyone. And the key signal kind of marker here is the sense of exhaustion, frustration, and fatigue, where you're basically like, you've been wearing your mask for so long, you've forgotten it's a mask. You think that investment banker or that perfect mom or that whatever, right? Uh, that perfect son, that perfect member of society uh, is the real you. And there are parts of you that are actually the real you that don't fit that societal given mask that have been chafing for a good 15, 20 years. And finally, the time bomb explodes. And, you know, it comes, you have dreams where it's, things, specters, you know, boogeymen are chasing you, um, recurring dreams for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. You get ulcers, you get this like bum knee that acts up, your back goes out. Uh, interestingly, right before a certain meeting always happens, your, your back always starts aching. Uh, it's inexplicable. The doctors scratching their heads, they have no idea, no idea what's going on. Uh, but you sense the pattern within yourself. You're just not given permission to point out the pattern. Hey, I think it's because this part that doesn't fit the damn mask you've been wearing for the past 20 years uh, is coming back and trying to like, you know, do something, say something. Uh, and we're, we're like, oh my gosh, you know, it's the terrorists, right? But the terrorists don't call themselves terrorists. They call themselves freedom fighters, right? And I'm not saying one or the other is right. I'm saying this is the state of affairs that is so. <clears throat> 
and the tension we feel in mid midlife is this battle of the parts that had been exiled before coming back. And, you know, the role of someone like me is to help build a narrative and guide you through the process of how you even engage with those parts of yourself. I mean, you can continue tonking them over the head and pushing them away, but are you really going to do that till you're 80 and you passed away with your grandchildren all around you, right? I mean, is that really, you know, how one would like to live, right? Um, after a certain point by 40 or 50, you realize, well, you know, I don't want to keep fighting them. Uh, I can't kill them definitively. I, I, I've tried for 20 years and it's not working, right? There's no amount of wine or whiskey that will like shut them up permanently. All right, so is there a third way? And the third way is the stuff that I tend to do, which is all the healing stuff, sort of reconciliation oriented. The archetype changes from control and conquest and domination to curiosity, reconciliation, uh, collaboration. Right, and figuring it out together. Uh, the archetype shifts right from one to the other. Uh, and again, the, the fact that when we talk about control, conquest, and domination, those fit perfectly and are perfectly native and perfectly at home in the world of the profane. And when we talk about switching the archetype over to things like reconciliation and curiosity, what are you feeling? What, do you, what are you here for? Right? What, what are your demands? What do you want? All of that fits in perfectly and is perfectly comfortable and native to the realm of the sacred. Right? And in a society which is just how it has happened, 99% profane and 1% sacred, every everywhere you go to, you know, like psychiatrists, counselors, buddies you have a beer with or tea with, talk, you know, parents, uh, clergy, will all be like, well, you, here's, you know, take this, read this book, take this pill, and it'll help you get a grip and get back on the horse and get back on track in life. It's all in the realm of the profane. Um, and so when we're in the realm of the sacred, we're like, oh my God, what, what even is this? <laughs> is this even a thing? Like no one's gonna judge me. I'm coming into this arty session on Sunday and he's not saying this is what you should do or have to do. This is like, is this even legal? <laughs> is this even a thing? How is this even a thing? And we forget what it's like to be uh, in a sacred zone. I'm reminding people all the time, please don't recommend books, even though you're not, you know, being compensated for it. It's like, it's just not, you know, we have to relearn how to, how to be in the sacred. Um, okay, so long story short, one way or another, the masks hopefully eventually come off one way or another. And we have what we call a midlife crisis. All kinds of shit in your life just break and crack and blow the fuck up. Right? Isn't that how it happens? Oh my gosh, she's cracked up. She's left her entire family and she's gone off to like, you know, India to like study yoga. And what the hell is wrong with her? The good girl mask just came off and was burned, you know, like just went down in flames. Uh, and everyone's stressed, the person is stressed, or, you know, like a typical man, he's driving a Maserati now, ha, 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 you know, with his hairpiece and, you know, trying to like, blah, 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 midlife crisis. And, and basically, you know, you can snicker and shame all you want, but this is a natural thing. This has happened to humans all throughout human history, where the mask at some point needs to come off. Because there's a phase of your life where we need you to wear the mask, and you wear it like a good little boy or girl. But in a proper, to me, society, which recognizes these ages and stages of human experience, there's a point where the mask comes off. And instead of like forcing you to stay masked for the rest of your life, we're like, no, 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 no. That's not the way it should happen at all. There's a season for the mask to be on and a season for the mask to be off. And in traditional cultures, right, where they recognize that there's a season for the mask to come off, they help you do it. Just like when you're about to like have a baby, there's all, they're, they're not just like, you know, going to the forest to deal with it, right? They're like, no, 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 there's like midwives, there's like OBGYNs, there's a whole sort of system, there's celebration, baby showers, there's all of this ritual support and scripting and structure to help you go from one phase to the next, from like pre-motherhood to motherhood, right? Uh, uh, as an example. And in societies which recognize this mask coming off, they didn't call it midlife crisis. They called it midlife initiation. 
they would initiate you from the early stage into the mid stage. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> I need to jump ahead to the third phase, and I'll come back and make some overall comments. This is later life, and this is again different for everyone. And this is a period of wisdom. Now, the thing is, you don't get to the later life phase without going through the midlife initiation. Right? So whether it was crisis or initiation, where someone, I mean, crisis is you're like, I can't wear this damn thing anymore. And you just claw it off your face, leaving scratch marks on your bare face when the mask comes off. And you don't even care anymore because you just cannot do it anymore. Okay. Midlife initiation is more like someone taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, I see you're like itching. You know, we're seeing certain behavior patterns um, <clears throat> that, uh, you know, maybe a sign of X, Y, Z. It's like, oh, I see your belly is getting bigger and that you're like craving pickles and ice cream. I, I think that may be a sign of something, right, that you're about to sort of uh, have a child. So let me support you through that. So similarly, you can have these signs and symbols. Um, not symptoms, because it's not a disease, right? It's a phase of life. Pregnancy is not a pathology, and neither is going through midlife initiation. Everyone does it. Uh, it's just painful when it's stuffed down and everyone acts like you shouldn't be going through it. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> for initiation, someone, um, in this case, someone like me, right, in the modern world, I suppose, comes to you and says, um, you know, uh, so just I'm going to do this in as gentle way as possible, but you know that's a mask you're wearing, right? And that's okay. Keep chilling. Keep chilling. That's a mask you're wearing. Um, and you can choose to keep it on. You can choose to take it off. You can choose to take it off just in sacred space and get a breather and like let, let the skin de-inflame. And then put it back on and then go like take care of everyone again as you were before. But it is a mask and you are the sovereign of your own life. You do have a choice as to like what masks you wear in what situations. And uh, I'm just kind of here to remind you of that fact, not telling you what you should do. Right? I'm, not, I'm not giving you another mask to put on. I'm just kind of here, this kind of trickster, healer, magician figure saying it is a mask and, and you know, you do have a choice. You do have a choice. So after that... <clears throat> Win, lose, or draw, however um, um, however this happens, you will go through experiences, you will learn things, you'll go through grief, uh, you'll laugh, you'll cry, right? And you will learn all kinds of stuff about this mask phenomenon, among other things. Right? If you're a woman, you'll learn all kinds of things about what kinds of masks you've been asked to wear and what kinds of nasty enforcements came on uh, when you tried to take it off, right? Let alone when you tried to even point out this is a mask, this may not be the real me. And everyone around you is like, what do you mean, dear? That's that's not, oh, that's, oh, oh, Jenna, that's not you. This is the real you. When people say that, they're like, put your fucking mask back on or else, right? Uh, and when you're a man and you try to sort of do that, um, there's similar kinds of, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, kind of enforcements and, and pain as well. So as a result of all that, as you initiate into the next phase, into the later phase of life, the elder phase of life, you have all this wisdom and you enjoy the wisdom. It, it helps you navigate because there's a there's the term tumultuous period where you rip all the masks off. And then the period after that, which is like, all right, I've blown everything up. Now, what do I do? Right. I don't care what other people think. But now what do I do? And I mean, if you ask me with all my biases, I'm like, well, obviously, let's go find your bliss. You know, that's that's I mean, why did we blow everything up? It wasn't just so you could be, you know, wild and free with no direction. There is an intrinsic direction in you. And it's that direction, that acorn growing up out of you that like pushed the mask off your face. So let's go figure out what your oak tree looks like. And we can kind of, you know, support it and uh, and celebrate it and just luxuriate in it. Right. Uh, bliss is lovely. Uh, yes, this is all being recorded. Uh, so when you play the replay, the slides, everything will show up. Uh, period of wisdom, mastery, fulfillment of your bliss. And then also to the extent that it's a part of your bliss, not everyone needs to do this. 
uh, but there's a sort of aspect of mentoring and guidance for others as well. Uh, not every Buddha that's been enlightened uh, needs to go back and save others. Um, and uh, there's a funny thing, and not funny, I mean, it's uh, uh, in certain Buddhist traditions, they have what they call a Pracheka Buddha, uh, which is a, a, a deep term of like derision. It's a very derogatory term uh, from the point of view of the clergy, uh, which is a Buddha that does not teach. So you've like made it, you've like attained your uh, enlightenment and in the diametric op opposite of like the bodhisattvas who like withhold their own enlightenment and go back and save everyone. You're just hanging out and you don't teach. You don't teach others um, how to attain enlightenment. Uh, and my position is uh, you don't have to, right? You don't have to do anything. I mean, there are deeper reasons why you don't need to teach. Um, why teaching itself is a kind of uh, adding to the illusion. But again, so mentoring and guidance of others, it's, it's only if you want to, only if you want to. So that's the three very quick rough cut, three phases of life. And what's interesting is when we tell the story of our lives, right? It really is the story of how we have progressed or how we even are right now progressing through these three phases of life. Right? When someone tells you you're the real deep life story, it's like, oh, when I was a child, you know, they told me I had to be this and that and stoic and strong. And, oh, man, one day I got hit on the softball field or the soccer field and I actually cried. And, and oh, boy, the way all the men reacted around me, that was the last time I ever cried in public, let me tell you. Right? They tell you the stories of how masks fell off. They tried to take them off and they got forced back on and drilled into their faces. Right. And then how they broke away. Well, you know, my first marriage, I had to blah, 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 blah. And then, uh, and then uh, they're typically telling this from the phase of later life where they're telling you the story arc of their life, which is the story of how they slashed and, you know, suffered through and, and made it through, hopefully, their three phases. <laughs> right. So the questions are typically like, what was your phase one like? What kind of masks were you handed? How many masks did you have to wear? How did you handle it? How harsh was the enforcement? Um, did we have the takeaway? What was the takeaway? So if you took your mask off, you know, what did that mean? And they called me like, you know, a wuss and a girly man in the locker room for crying, even though it wasn't that bad, right? So there was this takeaway that you will be incompetent, you will be useless, and nobody will love you, right? So all of that kind of storytelling, uh, exploring of the narrative. Uh, and then the question, of course, however it happened, right? What did that, what did that do to us? Right? What did that do to us? How did that impact how we then ripped off the mask or kept them on in fear till the very end in some cases, right? Uh, what fear sort of brought us to all, all these questions, are infinite permutations, but uh, these are the kinds of stories we talk about when we do healing and when we do bliss for that matter. And for me, the key insight of this whole sort of three app cycle, the key insight that's most interesting to me is this insight that comes in midlife where you do have this realization that like, wait a minute, this is a mask. This is not me. It's a part of me, I'll grant. But there are parts of me that don't fit in this mask. Like, so for me, right, so I am a, I'm a father, I'm an ex high tech, you know, CEO, founder, captain of industry. Uh, I'm Harvard, I'm Stanford, uh, I'm Chinese American, Asian American. Uh, and now I'm this like healer, long haired healer dude. <laughs> right. So those are all different masks. And so when I wear the healer mask, Right, there are parts of my life and personality, not many, but there are parts of my life and personality, like the goofy dad personality, for instance, right? Um, uh, that aren't at play when I'm wearing my healer mask, right? And that's okay, uh, as long as I know that it's a mask I'm wearing. I'm wearing, you know, it's okay to wear makeup when you go out. It's okay to put on a suit when you go out. It's a courtesy. Right? It's a courtesy. If I put a suit on out of love because I'm going to like a memorial service of a dear friend, putting the suit on is not out of fear. Well, what will people think of me if I wear jeans to the service? 
putting a suit on and looking good and cleaning up nicely is an act of love for the person I am, you know, I'm participating in the memorial service of, right? And when I put my healer mask on and I'm like on camera and I actually put on a sweater and, you know, like brush my hair, <laughs> it's an act of love. It's an act of like respect and, and just wanting to be together, right? It's not out of fear. However, when you put a mask on out of fear and you're like, oh, I have to be the perfect whatever, anything, right? Spouse, parent, whatever. Uh, it doesn't feel good because you're not putting it on because you want to. You're putting it on because you feel like you have a gun to your head, right? And after a while, you leave it on so long, there are bully voices within you that say, this is the real you. you know, and we all know that's not true. But when I say this is the real you and it has to be the real you, you keep it on out of fear and all the other parts of you are pushed away and they don't get any lighter air and they get pissed after a while and they come back as terrorists, freedom fighters, whatever you want to call them. Okay, exiles, exiles. And so um, but there's nothing intr intrinsically wrong with, um, with wearing a mask. Right. If I know I have a healer mask and there are other parts of me, like after the session, I take my healer mask off and I go visit my kids and I'm goofy dad again. Right. So you get to be all parts of yourselves, uh, ideally out of love, not fear. So that's like the main insight. You can take them off. You can choose the ones you put on. You can take those off too. Uh, and you can choose why to wear or not to wear a given mask. And the ideal, right, the, the, the formula, if you will, that not that you should do, but that does work at the end of the day for a lot of people. Uh, and then I don't know what will work for you personally. You, you need to try, right, and see what, what you like the best. Is to wear a mask or not wear a mask uh, out of love, not out of fear. Uh, the ideal is that you do the things you do in life. You make the decisions you make out of life. Ideally, and I know real life is messier than that, right? I get that. But the ideal, just to keep in mind, is that you do the things you do and you make the choices you make out of love, not fear. That's the ideal. Real life is messier, but that's that's the ideal. Right? Um, uh, so to you can choose your masks, your love, no matter what mask you wear or not wear, that you're loved whether you wear your mask successfully or not, that I don't lose love if I'm a shitty healer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and that you are loved without any condition. And that's a whole deeper healer thing that we won't get into here. Um, and, you know, the reason I gave this talk um, in a parenting class is that the theory, right, the, the, the operating theory is that I think the best scenario is that you learn all this sooner rather than later, sooner rather than later. Um, and for what it's worth, my own kids who are, uh, my daughter actually turned 20 last week. I'm like, when did that happen? So I have a 20 year old uh, and a 13, soon to be 14 year old. Uh, and if you would like to put it in these uh, harsh terms, I've been experimenting on my own children. <laughs> Or from day one, I'm like, you know, you get that you're loved without condition. You get that if you get straight, that if you get straight Fs, you don't lose any love. And they're like, yeah, yeah, dad, we get that. But do you also get that if you get straight A's, win the Nobel Prize, and like, you know, get into every Ivy League college on the planet, right? You don't gain love. Your stock price doesn't go up. And they're like, Phew. right? It's like, that's incredible. So um, my kids, to the best of, our ability as parents have been told they can wear whatever mask they want. Uh, but even then, right, the rest of society doesn't give them that message. So it's like they still get some of that stuff from. Uh, so anyway, the open question is, uh, is it OK to like basically push that initiation of realizing it's a mask and you can wear whatever mask you want earlier in life? Um, and is that okay is kind of a moot point. It's like, is it even possible? Because it's not just the parents, it's like the rest of the society that does it. Uh, so anyway, that's always a, a really interesting um, question in general. 
But for me, the working hypothesis is that I so impose on my children <laughs> is that the sooner you realize this, the better off you are. The sooner you realize this, the better and sweeter life you will have. Uh, I think my kids are doing all right so far, but you know, they'll be the judge of that. They'll tell me later. Um, uh, and you know, you know, they'll have an opinion. <laughs> you know, they'll have an opinion. All right, so let's keep going. Okay, so the only other extra thing here uh, that I wanted to talk about was this three phases of life. Uh, I didn't do this during the talk. This is custom for you. Um, <clears throat> and there's just a couple more little kind of little points I wanted to make here. Um, and let me get a little bit fancy and turn my pen on. So hopefully you can see my pen here. So here we're talking about the three phases of life. Hopefully you can see my, my chicken scratch drawing there. And so basically it's girl boy going to man woman, uh, queen king, and then crone slash sage. So you're like, wait a minute, I thought you said there are three phases, there are four phases. So the three phases are actually more the three transformations. So here, if you excuse my nerd out here, um, so transformation one is initiation from child to adult, right? girl to woman, boy to man. And this is what we talked about basically last session on the masculine side. Uh, now girl going to woman, I'm, I'm, I don't, feel comfortable. I'm a, I'm a man. I'm not going to mansplain. Like, there's only so much I'm willing to mansplain. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but here, this is what we talked about when we did the Telemachus story in the Odyssey. All right. This is last session. And then from woman to queen, man to king, this is midlife initiation. This is when we say you can take your masks off. They're masks. You can choose what masks you wear. And when you realize that, you ascend into full sovereignty of your life. You enter into the queen phase, the king phase. So here, masks, oops, on. And here, masks, off. And on by choice, right? Um, and then Gowry has selected an incredible story to story snippet to illustrate here. Um, also from the Odyssey. So if you hate the Odyssey, you'll know that you, you, you have the back half of this talk free because you can go. <laughs> All right. And then um, on by choice on you put your masks back on here out of love, not fear. Okay. Now, what happens during this midlife initiation is frankly a period of grief, a period of grief, then healing. And then from here onward, you kind of start to find your bliss. Um, let me put that as a question mark, right? Somewhere here. And I just want to say a couple words about sort of this process. Here, let's change colors here so we can see it better. So the first phase of life is say masks on phase. So it's like say here, right? And the second phase is say masks off, grief, healing. And the third phase is wisdom, bliss, mentorship. So mentor in the Telemachus story is a king slash sage, right? He's the king, but he also has grandchildren at that point, right? Children and grandchildren. And he is the one, very interesting. It's not always the case, but it skips... Uh, generations. You can all see, yeah, you should be able to see the writing on my slides. Oh, you can't see my writing. Gary, when we did the test, you could see my writing, right?
Sorry, Gary was texting me. Let me just read. Oh, I apologize. So I guess when we did the test with Gowry, you couldn't, you could see my, all right, all right, all right. Let me do, all right, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, all right, let me see how to do this here. Give me one second. Please stand by while we deal with our technical issues. All right. Uh, I'm going to do a super fancy share now. One second. All right, you asked for it. Now we're going to share my entire screen. Okay, so you should be able to see my entire screen. And let me... Let me try and realign this here. Uh, sorry, sorry. This is like when you want to make sure you are clear with your editor what you're testing. Okay. So now you should be able to see, okay, I, I can't check in with you and show my writing. So I need to turn off my writing. Okay, can you see? Okay, you can see, okay, okay. So you could see it before. Now I'm going to go back and okay. All right, sorry. I'm just I'm just too fancy for my tech. Too fancy for my tech. Okay. Let me change colors here again. <clears throat> All right. So uh, initiation, midlife, telemachus, masks on, initiation, midlife, masks off, or on by choice. Okay, and you can watch me as I check in with you. I want to make sure we can see you. Okay. Okay. And um, so this phase here is masks on, phase one of life. This phase here is masks off, midlife initiation and a period of grief and healing. And this phase here is the third phase, a period of wisdom and bliss. And if you want, only if you want mentorship, okay? And as I was saying in the Telemachus story, it was mentor, the guy here, that skipped generations and went back and guided Telemachus back here and guided him from here to here. Right. And there's a theory in some traditional cultures where um, it's not the father who initiates the son. It's the grandfather who initiates the son or grandmother who initiates the daughter. Uh, and even in societies where it's this generation that initiates the previous generation, it's never the parent themselves. It's the uncles, it's the aunts, because there's too much tension uh, between so, so literally, that's where this phrase comes. It takes a village to raise a kid. And, you know, when we have like single parents, when we have like parents who are just nuclear family and there's no village around them and they're trying, they read books on initiation. They're like, well, I'm going to initiate my kid. It's like, I mean, it, it kind of works, but not really. Right. Uh, with my own son, I, I basically initiated him myself because there were no men around me who like talk like I do. Right. So the only one to give him the... The message was me. Um, and I think it's worked out okay. Um, but there are other friends of mine who have like young uh, uh, sons who I have been able to initiate and that's been, that's been unbelievable. Okay, so let me just check my... Um, so the only other thing I wanna say here is 
in this period of grief and healing, um, how do you know, hopefully you're all still with me. How do you know when you've gone from boy to man or girl to woman? Uh, and that's that's easier, right? You know you, you've gone from one to the other when you know what mask you're supposed to wear and you've decided, you know, you've come to terms with whether you're going to wear it or not, how much you're going to wear it if so, or if you're going to be the rebel and, and blow them all away or whatever. But you've decided. So you've, you've crossed the threshold of your initiation. And by the way, the fact that we don't have structured initiation in our society is not all bad. Like one of the reasons all these traditional structures came down was the rise of the individual in, in Western culture. So we blew away all these things because, you know, if I'm supposed to be a warrior in my native tribe and I don't want to be a warrior, what can I do about that? And the answer is nothing. Right? But now in our society, we can be whatever we want to be. Uh, we have like ultimate freedom to be whatever we want. But the cost of that is we have no structured initiation. Right, so now you have all this freedom. The classic question is, well, what are you going to do with all that freedom? And people have no freaking clue. Right? They're aimless. They're in their 30s, and they're still aimless. They have no idea. Uh, and that's okay. That's not your fault. It's just, it's just the way society is structured. So the ideal, right, the ideal is to have full freedom and then also to find direction, uh, which is why I do it the way I do it, which is like, okay, we heal we do the healing, we get through all that, we take the masks off, we put the ones back on out of love that we want. But then we find the stream of quote unquote love slash bliss within us to find the, the intrinsic meaning and purpose of our life. And then that's what we initiate into, right? So it's not that there's nothing, it's aimless. You can be, you can be whatever you wanna be, but when you look inside and find your bliss, it you find that there is a river and it is going in a certain direction. Um, and, and it is still freedom because it's not imposed from the outside. Like when I say we're in sacred space to take higher guidance, it's like however you choose to, to define that, right? But when you, and, and the trick that makes it all possible is you're like, well, this all sounds very like new age, hippy dippy and like, you know, theoretical. Yeah, that's fine. But when you go down into the well and you like plug into the river that is within you, uh, you know, you've hit it. Right, it's unmistakable. You may not have words to describe it, but you know when you've hit it. Right, and if that weren't the case, then none of this would hold together. But thankfully, right, uh, I mean, the world didn't have to be created like this, but this is how we find it, and it's fabulous. It's fabulous. Um, okay, so then the last thing I want to say here, what is the last thing I want to say here? Is if that's how you know how you go from this phase to that phase, how do you know when you've gone through the masks off phase, midlife, and you've come into your queendom, kingdom, and potentially even moving into your crone stage? This elder initiation thing, we're not even gonna talk about that today. We just, just forget it. Most of modern life, we're stuck here. Like, I mean, we, we live in an adolescent society. I mean, just look at half like the political leaders in our world. I mean, they're adolescents. We live in an adolescent society. We have no idea what we would even die for, let alone live for. So we're all stuck here. So let's work on this. We can talk about this. This part here, just forget it. Just don't even worry about that. Like I'm not even just, yeah. Let's do, as I said to a friend recently, let's just focus on one impossible thing at a time. Shall we? <laughs> And we'll get there. We'll get there. All right. So then <clears throat> we've talked about this. Now let's talk about this. And for me, it is this double piston of um, uh, healing and bliss. Let me just take a peek to make sure you're all there. Okay. No wild riots or complaints about like not being able to see my screen. So it must be okay. All right. It is this double piston of healing and bliss. You you try one, you move forward, and then you switch to the other, right? So that's great. Um, one of the signal markers for going through this phase is, first of all, you go into grief. 
you go deeply into grief. Right, if, if, if the classical question, running out of colors here, but let's go with yellow. If the classical question of this phase is what's wrong with me, I'm putting my, I'm trying to put my mask on, it keeps falling off because my face is too bumpy for this mask, right? Like I should be a good girl and like quiet and I don't interrupt others, I'm not bossy, I'm not nasty. But I, I can't help but like speak my mind in, in groups of people, right? And everyone looks at me horrified because I'm taking off my good girl mask. The signal question here is, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? I, I'm a bad person. I'm like a bad, you know, sort of wife. I'm a bad daughter. And similarly, you know, I'm, I'm a bad man. I'm a weak man. Uh, I don't kick the ball as far as other boys do. I don't make as much, much money as other men do. What's wrong with me? And then when we get to this phase, the question changes from what's wrong with me to shit, I've been wronged. I've been wronged. I was duped into wearing this stupid piece of, you know, whatever mask for 15, 20 years, and I'm not going to do it anymore. And everything blows up and you go into midlife crisis. Okay. Ideally, uh, and reality is messier. But ideally, you then go into grief. You don't run away and numb it away, the pain. You go into grief. You sit with the loss. And, and there are other sessions, even in Live Sacred Space, where I talk about the power of grief, especially in the middle of the pandemic with all the losses we were sustaining, the difference between grief and depression, all of that we've covered already. So I won't go over it again. But the power of grief is the power of healing. There is no healing without going directly, ideally willingly, and headlong into grief. It is terrifying, but, you know, I mean, let me just clear this out here. Let's be honest. By the time you've gone through this and the time you're like busting through this, all this stuff you've been through for the past like 15, 20 years, you get to hear and I say, go into grief. And you're going, oh my gosh, that sounds terrifying. I mean, it's not the hardest thing you've done up to this point in your life anyway, right? I mean, having put gone through all this as a man or a woman, as a man or a woman, uh, you've gone through a lot of like crap already. Okay, so when I say, okay, let's like think, let's at least give it a good faith consideration of like taking some time out to go into grief. You know, I know it's scary. I know it's going to be painful and uncomfortable, but it's hardly the hardest thing you've done, right? So you have the capability. If anything, you've built the muscles for going into grief here. Okay. And then as you come into this phase uh kind of you know we're touching a little bit into elder initiation here what is the signal if the signal going from uh sorry if the signal going from here to here was from what's wrong with me to i've been wrong the signal going from here to here goes from I've been wronged to uh, grief. And then what's on the other side of grief? How do you know you're done with the grieving period? Uh, I get this question all the time. Uh, actually, not as often as I would like because few people have the courage to go into grief. But when they go into grief and they're deep in it, this question will come up. How do I know when I'm done? Right. And the snide answer is when you stop as asking that question, right? So that's that's one answer. But there is there are other markers there, which is, and one way to think about them is you are coming out of the other end of the tunnel of grief when you find yourself in a state of spontaneous, for no good reason, gratitude and blessing. There's that word blessing again. Gratitude and blessing. And I say spontaneous, not like, oh, but, you know, I am grateful. I, I do feel blessed I, and I'm blessing everyone I can find. So does that mean I'm done with grief now? It's like, not like that, right? It's like when people work with forgiveness, they're like, oh, you know, you know, you, you need to forgive people. So they put a gun to their own heads and they forgive everyone around them. 
And it's not real forgiveness. It's an impoverished version of forgiveness because in that state, I'm only forgiving you because I think I'm going to get relief from my pain. And that's not real forgiveness. Right? Real forgiveness is when my pain is resolved within myself and then I just bestow the blessing of forgiveness on you for no good reason and no benefit to me. Right, so blessing and gratitude and blessing are the similar here. And this is described once um, beautifully by, uh, oh, I forgot the name of this, some, I forgot the name of, of the speaker, but, uh, but it was just great image, right? So uh, a great sort of sort of image or classic example of this is when you're a guy and you've just gone through this nasty divorce, okay? And she took everything and she's like, whatever, you know, dragged you through the mud and blah, 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 all the stuff you can say. And it's finally finalized, right? And you've gone through grief and gnashing of teeth and everything. Big on, full on midlife crisis, triggered by, let's say it's a man and a woman marriage for the sake of example. Let's triggered by her, by you, whoever blew up, masks came off and, and divorce was part of it. So then at the end of that process, the, the visual that was given was, this guy then calls together all of his buddies to the bar to say, you know, my divorce is finalized, I wanna be with my buddies, and they all come together. And what would you expect, right, that gathering to be like? And the way it was described was, Instead of, oh, you know, that so-and-so, that horrible witch and, you know, good riddance and blah, 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 blah. That's one way it could go. That's one way it could go. But it goes instead in a different way. Where the guy says, uh, you know, I've gathered you all here, all my, my guy friends, right? My men who've been supporting me through hell and high water, through thick and thin. And I just want to raise a glass to my ex-wife everything that's happened through the thick and thin, all the hell she put me through that I put her through too. And everyone starts laughing because all your guy friends know, right? It was at least half, if not more than half your issue, but they're your, they're your guy friends. So they support you. Right. And they're all like laughing. Oh, you're just finally sort of getting it. <laughs> and basically, right. You as the guy, you thank your wife in that. Toe. She's not even there. It's just your guy friends, right? It's just in the locker room, in the locker room. Right. And I choose my words carefully. And this is what you're saying in the locker room. You know, she taught me everything I know. She gave me my kids, you know, gave me a put up with all my stuff. And even in the divorce, she could have like, you know, she's she skinned me down on the bones, but she at least left me my bones. Right. So gratitude and I bless her and I wish her all the happiness in the world uh, going forward. You know, even though she she had to put up with me. Even more so, she deserves the best in the world going forward. Here, here, and everyone raises a glass, right? Uh, that could be happening in locker rooms. Or you don't know. You don't know, right? But that feeling of gratitude and blessing at the end of it, when you have that for no reason, and she's not there, you're not trying to impress her, you're not in the middle of a negotiation, you're not trying to butter her up, you're done, done. And that's how you feel that's when you know you're at the end of grief. That's how you know, right? Now again, just like forgiveness, if you gather your friends and play act it, doesn't count, doesn't count. It has to just be the tack on at the end that happens to happen uh, that way for no good reason. Uh, okay, so, all right, we're at 11 o'clock. Let me just, uh, oops. I think that's all I wanted to say. Unshare my screen here. Uh, okay. So, uh, hang on a second. Let me just check my notes. I think that was all. Okay, so I think that's all I had to say. And so for now, for the next part of the talk, um, Gary, if you're there, uh, why don't you come up 
and tell us about the story you've selected uh, for this part of it. And you're on mute, looks like you're on mute. Uh, hang on, let me see if I can unmute you. Uh, I can't, I think you have to do it. Okay, she's gonna come back, okay. So let me just check. Okay, Facebook folks are still there, that's great. Uh, and let me pull up my notes again. Gary, I'm gonna re-invite you. Okay, so we'll wait a second for Gary to come back. Um, you there? All right, I'm gonna try that again. Um, okay. Hey, LT, can you hear me? Hey, yeah, I can hear you now. Perfect. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, so that took a bit of a lag. <laughs> okay. So oh, I'm on. You're good. You're on. Um, okay. So we've got, uh, you know, the other side of Odysseus's story that we didn't cover last time. Uh, so we, we spoke about Telemachus and how Athena took it upon herself to finally put an end to, uh, you know, the ordeal that Odysseus was going through and going back home safe to Ithaca, right? And she decided, we need to do this, and she convinces the gods um, that enough is enough. Odysseus has gone through a great deal of suffering, so let's just you know, get him back home. And um, so you kind of, from there, you know, the first thing she decides to do is, you know, have, uh, you know, Telemachus take this journey because he needs to be initiated into manhood. So we spoke about that. And, and Telemachus, when he sets out to find news about his father, hears from Menelaus that um, the last anyone ever heard of Odysseus was when he was stranded on an island with a nymph called Calypso and he was unable to leave from there for whatever reason and and that's it you know we don't know what happened after that and even as this conversation is is happening the gods have decided that they will then guide Odysseus on his journey back home, right? So while Athena is helping Telemachus here, um, Hermes goes to Calypso, right? He goes to the island where Calypso's kept Odysseus. But the thing about this is Calypso's not holding him down by force, right? She's holding him down out of affection, care, and protectiveness. She saved his life when his ship wrecked off the coast and, you know, she's fed him and kept him safe and warm and all of that. And now she doesn't want to let him go because she cares for him. And there's such a thing as too much kindness, right? So she doesn't want to let him go until Hermes, the messenger of the gods, comes to her and says, okay, this has gone on long enough, and we all think that Odysseus does not really belong here. He needs to go back to Ithaca. So Calypso, you need to release him. You need to let him go. And then, you know, uh, Calypso is like, she knows now that the gods have told her that this is what she needs to do, she has to do it. She has no choice. At the same time, she's like, how is this fair? You know, I saved his life. I'm fond of him. I want to care for him. He's all right here. And then why would you want to take him away? This is, this is not okay. How is this okay? You just come and tell me that 
I need to let him go. How can I let him go? And all of that, that happens, right? But ultimately, she knows she needs to do this. Um, the gods want it. So she lets him go. And Odysseus is finally able to take that journey back home. But it's not easy. It's not just smooth sailing, leave the island and just get back to Ithaca, just one short journey. That isn't, there are still many, many more adventures, many, many more things that happen on the way. But I want to talk about just this one aspect where he does the most unexpected thing that he could ever imagine. And he is required to go down into the underworld and meet the spirits of the dead. So how this comes about is after he sets sail and his Calypso lets him go, he reaches, you know, has a couple of other misadventures, but he reaches another island, which is ruled by a sorceress called Circe. And, uh, you know, and she's, she's no ordinary sorceress. She even manages to convert, uh, transform half of his crew into swine and locks them up in a pigsty. So she is dangerous, right? And Odysseus is like, his the other half of the crew say that let's just leave, you know, let's not even try to mess around with the sorceress. Let's just leave. We've had too much trouble already. We can't ha afford to have any more. But Odysseus wants to rescue his crew. He doesn't know how, but he doesn't want to leave them alone, or leave them back. And Hermes once again appears, but this time he appears to Odysseus and he says, this is a dangerous sorceress, but I can help you with this magical herb that I give you. It will protect you from her enchantments, right? So you go into her house with this magical herb and you can come out of it without being turned into a pig, right? So I'll give you this and I'll also tell you what to do so that when she realizes her enchantments don't work on you, she will help you with the next steps of your journey. She'll help you get back home, right? So Odysseus does what Hermes asks him to do. And as he predicts, the moment Circe realizes her magic does not work on him, she, you know, turns into a friendly uh, goddess and she um, helps his crew rest and rejuvenate and wine and dine and get all of their rest. In fact, when Odysseus says, all I want to do is leave, she even tells them, well, I will help you leave, but you've gone through a lot. You've suffered a lot. You, you're exhausted. Your men are exhausted. So you should kind of get rest and then I'll tell you what to do next. So when all of that happens and Odysseus is eager to know what, what next, what, what does he need to do to get back to Ithaca? Circe tells him it's not going to be a straightforward thing, right? You will need to do one more task before you set sail. And that one task is that you need to go down into the underworld. And you need to find the spirit of Tiresias, the prophet, the blind prophet from Thebes. He has he's been dead for a long time but you'll find a spirit in the underworld. You need to meet him and ask for his guidance and he'll be able to guide you back. So that is the task you have ahead of you. When Odysseus listens to this, I mean, it's shocking, right? He says, you want me to do what? I mean, I've just gone through a whole life of trials and tribulations and I've managed to survive through some bizarre misadventures. And the final thing you're telling me to do is to go down into the underworld. No one has ever done that before. Like you don't go into the underworld sort of willingly, voluntarily when you're alive. How does that even work? And once you go into the underworld, I mean, who's ever done that before? And once you go into the underworld, who has ever even returned alive? How does that happen? So basically, do you want me to die? Is, is that what you're saying here, right? 
So he, he is completely destroyed. He even starts weeping and says, what is this task? What am I supposed to do now? And Cersei tells him, well, I'm going to tell you how to get there and how to meet the spirit of Tiresias. Follow my instructions and you'll be able to go there and get back with his guidance. And you need it before you set sail, right? So she tells him, she gives him directions and says, you need to go here and to, you know, sail onto the river and, you know, the river mouth that opens into the ocean. That is the point where you enter the underworld. And when you get there, you dig out a pit, right? It, like a cubit and you get into the middle of it. You pour offerings to the spirits of the dead in the underworld you know you pour honey and water and sprinkle barley and all of those things you also need to invoke the spirits and make a vow to the spirit of tiresias that when you get back home safe to ithaca after tiresias guides you the first thing that you will do is make a sacrifice of a young heifer who's not had a calf yet, the best of heifers that you have, and you're going to make a sacrifice for uh, the spirit of Tiresias because he helped you get back home. Make a vow, invoke the spirit, and, and then at that moment, you will also have to sacrifice a black ram and a ewe, right, two sheep, and I'll help you with that. I'll, I'll give you the, the sheep. And when you sacrifice, pour the blood into the pit. And then you step back and wait for the spirits to come. It won't be just Tiresias. All the spirits might just turn up because they're so eager when they see all of this offering and the blood, they'll just turn up. But make sure that no one gets to drink the blood uh, until you've spoken to Tiresias. That should be your condition. So you hold up your sword, and you point it at them and say, I'm not going to let you drink until I've spoken to Tiresias. That's what I've come here for. And Odysseus is like, okay, let's do this if this has to be done. And he follows all of Circe's instructions and does what she's told him to do. He you know, takes his ship, sails on the river, gets to the mouth of the ocean and then, you know, digs up a pit, uh, makes the offerings, makes the sacrifices, and then pours the blood into the pit, stands back with his sword, and the spirits start, start coming one by one. You know, there's so many spirits. He even sees the spirit of his mother, but she's kind of lurking behind. And then the first spirit to come forward and speak to him is a crew member, Elpina. And Odysseus is like, what are you doing here? I just sailed from the island of Circe and you're already here. How does that happen? And what Odysseus doesn't realize is while they were leaving, Elpina is the last to kind of descend and come and is already so drunk that while climbing down the ladder, he, he slips and falls, breaks his neck and dies. And because they were so busy, nobody notices it. And, you know, they're here. So Elpina tells him this and says, I have one request of you. When you're done with this and you go back to Circe's Island, please, please don't leave me unburied. Please make sure that you give me a proper farewell. I don't want to be just left stranded. Right. So uh, Odysseus agrees and he says, I will do that for you. I promise you. And then the spirit of Tiresias walks up, you know, it just comes forward. And when he looks at Odysseus, he says, you know, Odysseus, why have you come here? What kind of mission has brought you here alive? Nobody comes here. Right? It's so dark and somber and, you know, it's just not the kind of place for living people. What are you doing here? And Odysseus says, I've come to meet you. I've come to talk to you. 
and and this is this offering is for you so then he says okay stand back and keep your sword back i need to drink the blood first so that i can communicate with you i can tell you what i need to tell you right and he drinks up the blood and then says okay you want me to tell you how to get back home right and you think that your journey back home is this just sweet journey that you know it's one straight sail back it's it's not going to be like that poseidon is still mad at you you blinded his son polyphemus you know one of the giants this is another famous story where ulysses is in a cave odysseus is in a cave and this giant one-eyed giant eats up his crew so odysseus through trickery manages to escape from the cave and blinds polyphemus right the giant and polyphemus is poseidon's son so he says that Poseidon is still angry with you for blinding his son. He's not going to let you go so easily. He's still mad at you. So this journey is not going to be straightforward, but you may still have some hope. So here's what you need to do. When you set back, go back from here, when you set sail from Circe's Island, you know, sail towards you know, sail in the direction of um, of this island that belongs to, I forget the name, but this island that belongs to the sun god, Helios. And when you get there, you will see these fine cattle grazing and, you know, fine sheep. But remember, they all belong to the sun god. So you can't touch them, you can't harm them. You let them be and you will get safe passage. If any harm comes to them, then that's just, just a disaster. You're not going to get back home. So that's point number one to remember, right? And the next thing is you will still be able to get back home if you control your urges and you control your crew, you control your men, and you have a hold over them, you might still be able to make it safe. But here's the thing, even if that doesn't happen, even if you lose all your men, you will get back home, you know, absolutely exhausted. Like, you know, you, you might even turn up like a beggar. You may get passage uh, on a stranger's boat, but you will ultimately land in Ithaca and you'll find out that you know, your house is ridden with suitors who are trying to woo your wife with gifts and presents, and you'll need to sort that out. You will be able to do that with a little bit of trickery, but you'll also use violence and you'll kill them. So all of that needs to happen. And then it doesn't end there, right? Once you're done with that, once you've reclaimed your kingdom, once you've reclaimed your, uh, you know, your house, you reunite with your wife and your son. What you then need to do is take your oar that that you've used to row your boat. You take your oar and you travel inland. You travel inward, deep inside the land, to a point where the people there have never seen the ocean you know to the point where they haven't even tasted salt you need to travel so far into the land until a stranger a traveler meets you and asks you why are you carrying the ore that you're carrying the, the ore that you used to row the boat he asks you why are you carrying a winnowing fan with you because he doesn't recognize what an oar looks like and what it even does. He's never seen the ocean. So until that point, you will travel. And that is the point where you'll put your oar down and just take it into the, into the earth and make a sacrifice to Poseidon. That is when all this will be over, right? And that is when death will come to you peacefully and all your people of your kingdom will live happily so that's that's the entire journey panned out it's a map right this is what you need to do 
And Odysseus says, okay, I, I hope that, that it will all come to that because I don't see any other way out. But tell me one thing, why does my mother look around? Looks like she doesn't recognize me and why doesn't she talk to me? And then Tiresia says, oh, that's easy. You just have to let her come forward and drink the blood, and sacrificial blood, and she will talk to you. So Odysseus, now that he's got Tiresias' guidance, he just doesn't leave. He wants to know what's, what's happening here in the spirit land of the dead. So he waits for his mother to come forward. And once she drinks the blood, she, she looks at him and immediately starts crying. He says, she says, oh, oh, my son, why have you come here? And he in turn asks her, why are you even here? Because the last time I saw you, back home when i left home you were alive but how are you here and the mother tells him that i died of grief waiting for you and and odysseus is, is completely in grief at this hearing this right and he then wants to know what else has happened when he was away so he asks what about my father what about my wife my son and his mother tells him your father doesn't even live in the palace anymore. He doesn't even live in the town anymore. He's somewhere away in the country. And during summer and autumn, he's been sleeping on a bed on the ground, on a bed of, you know, withered leaves. And in the winter, he lives in a hut and sleeps by the fire. And he wears rags for clothes. He's been grieving and waiting and grieving and waiting for you. And I couldn't take it anymore. I just could not watch him grieving like that. And I myself was grieving for you. So, you know, I just died. And at this point, Odysseus wants to kind of embrace his mother and cry. But because she is dead and she's just a shadow, he can't even touch her. And he laments that. He says, I can't even hug you. And, and then he asks, what about my wife and son? Are they okay? What's happened? Has she married someone else? Because, you know, they may as well have given me up for dead. And and she says, well, you know, but Penelope is, is quite strong. She's not given up hope. She's still waiting. And so is your son. And after hearing all of this, you know, so there are all these other spirits who keep coming and wanting to drink that blood and wanting to talk. And what Odysseus does is that rather than letting all of them come and drink the blood at once, he holds up the sword and then he guides them. And he lets all the other spirits drink up the blood one by one and talk to him and tell their stories. And it so happens that all these spirits are wives of... Uh, warriors and heroes, and he meets a long list of them, you know, daughters. Um, he meets Heracles' wife. He meets, um, you know, um, he, he meets Minos' wife, um, Ariadne, Phaedra, you know, all of the great heroes and warriors, wives and daughters. And everyone has a story to tell. And he sits there and listens to all of them. And then once this is, you know, he even tells when he's narrating the story somewhere else, he says, I, I can't even begin to list the number of women I, I spoke to that day, that night. Okay. And after this, there's a series of warriors and comrades, his own friends, Achilles, Agamemnon, Ajax. He meets all of them. And in fact, he's even taken aback when he sees Agamemnon there because... As far as he knows, Agamemnon went back from Troy, back to his own uh, kingdom. How is he even dead? And Agamemnon tells him, well, my friend, I was killed by my wife and her lover. They plotted against me. So a word of advice, when you get back home, make sure what you know what's going on before you just announce your arrival. Be careful because you can't trust anyone. And least of all women, you know, speaking from experience. So he listens to Agamemnon's story, grieves with him over his death. And then he meets Achilles and he tells Achilles, well, 
you know, you're a hero, you died a hero's death and glory is all yours. And you're here, you hold such influence in the underworld and what more could you ask for? And Achilles says, well, you know, I, I would any day trade this life, you know, uh, to, to get back the life in, in the real world. You don't know how lucky you are. And, and Odysseus says, well, do you know the kind of trials and tribulations I've gone through? Do you know what I've been through to get here? And I still don't know when I'm going to get back home. And Achilles says, well, you know, I would rather have that, rather have life as a peasant than spend my time here. So you're still lucky, right? No matter what you've gone through, you're still lucky. So he hears all these stories and the more and more he hears, the more and more, you know, sort of chilly it gets for him. And more and more spirits start coming and they are like wailing and crying. And, and after a while, he just can't bear it anymore. And then he just stands up and says, okay, I'm done here. I need to go. And by the time morning's breaking and I've spent a whole night in the underworld, I'm not going to sit here any longer. And he gets back into the ship and he goes back to Circe's Island, right? And from there, you know, his journey back home begins. A whole series of adventures again. You know, it's it's called the Odyssey for a reason. I think it's a, the Odyssey has come to mean such a long and, you know, series of adventures and misadventures and tragedies and losses because of how the story goes on. But I wanted to focus on this key event, which I found very significant because of uh, what Tiresias means to Odysseus at this phase, in the sense that Odysseus can't even begin the journey back home before speaking to Tiresias, the prophet. So it, it's, it's kind of very, very telling that while um, Telemachus is having a conversation with Mentor and Nestor back there to have his own initiation into manhood. Odysseus is going through an initiation phase here with, with Tiresias from the land of the dead. So that's the story I wanted to share today. And um, Artie, would you like to come online and share your thoughts? Hey. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, that was amazing. So uh, I have some thoughts to share. I was uh, taking notes here. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the perfect. Okay, so there's so much to say. I'm, I'm going to try to not make my comments too long. But one thing I want to do is, um, so I, I do want to focus on the Tiresias yeah. part of this because um well two things so actually let me share my screen i'll do the full screen share okay uh, uh, and hopefully this doesn't look too let me turn you guys can see my screen right yeah okay yeah, and so the thing I wanted to say here was, and I'm going to start writing. So if you don't see writing, yell. So here, Athena, mm -hmm. you see that, right? Athena? Yeah. Is the one that calls Telemachus up. Come up, be a man, do your thing, go out and adventure and figure out what mask you're supposed to wear. A mentor will help you. And Athena comes in the form of mentor. Here, it's Circe for midlife initiation, telling Odysseus not to go up, to, but to go down into the underworld and grief. I mean, everything about the journey into the underworld is grief, gnashing of teeth. The minute Circe says it to Odysseus, they're alone. Odysseus has not even said it to his men. Just Circe and Odysseus alone, he bursts into tears. 
and he is like, you have got to be kidding me. Right. How do we, where, where do I, how do we even, know, how do I even physically sail my ship to even get there? It's not on any map. And she's like, don't worry. You're pretty little head about that. I'll take care of that. And he's like, who even are you? What, what is even going on here? Right. So the muse is here and the muse is here. <clears throat> now, when he goes down and then comes back up, right, what happens down here, right? And there are a number of things. There's just too much to go into detail, but I'm just going to, I just want to touch on a couple of them. The first is he gets, and we've talked about this in grieving, honoring the dead in our past LSS sessions, the power of grief, the power of grief in transforming the dead into ancestors. So he encounters a bunch of ancestors, Elpinor being the first of them. And the first thing Elpinor asks for is, you need to go back and bury me properly. right? Because he is an ungrieved kinsman yeah. who cannot transform into an ancestor until he is properly grieved. So the beauty of this episode down here is he gets all kinds of specific instructions on how to navigate the odyssey of an entire life. Everything about how you need to basically live a life in the in the you know, cosmology and the worldview of the Greeks, which is which has hand, been handed down to us basically, uh, more or less intact, can be read in Telemachus and then in this in everything really, but. The specific parts are Telemachus, how he's guided by Athena. We talked about it in the last session. And then the instructions Odysseus gets down here. Um, so he goes down. And what happens when you go down into grief? You get wisdom from Tiresias. And I'll, I'll save him for later. I want to come back to Tiresias. You get instructions from the ungrieved dead. Go back up and grieve me. Cry. Stop hushing yourself when you're at my funeral. You should be tearing your clothes and gnashing teeth, pounding the floor. Right? Um, and if anyone tells you to be quiet during a funeral, you should punch him in the face and say, why aren't you crying too? Right? Grief itself is a form of praise and honor that fills the sails of the dead to, for them to make it over to the shore of the ancestors. Um you screw everyone, yourself included, when you suppress grief. This goes for loss of loved ones. This also goes for losses in your life. In other words, when you say here, what's wrong with me? I'm not doing it right. And you come to here and you say, I've been wronged. Why have I been you know, wearing this stupid good girl mask for 20 years. I'm not going to have it anymore. I've lost all my best years to wearing the good girl mask, to wearing the strong boy, competent man mask. That grief must not be suppressed. That grief must not be suppressed. Okay. Because that's how you transform the dead of your lost 20 years into an ancestor, right? If you don't grieve those lost 20 years, you don't transform it into an ancestor. And what does an ancestor do? It protects you, it gives you wisdom and guidance, and it gives you your identity. You don't know who you are until you can say, I'm Arthur, son of William, and you know, son of Arthur, right? Um, it gives you a, a portion of your identity. And when you have your identity, you know your direction as well, in part. The other thing that happens is your grief, oops, uh, your grief, deepens even more plus plus sorry i'm hitting the button by accident plus plus in other words you go down into grief and then he meets his mother and he's like i didn't even know even know you were dead so when he's down there he realizes his mother is dead now if you read this as a dream his mother is a part of his inner feminine um agamemnon is a part of his inner masculine etc cetera, etc cetera. But the way I would always read this is you go down into grief and because you're sitting with the loss, because you're thinking about your lost loved one or the lost 20 years, turning it around, looking at it, sitting with it, holding it, you realize additional losses you wouldn't have even realized if you hadn't come down and sit with the pain. So sitting with the pain 
deepens the pain even further. And we know that's, I mean, we instinctively know that. That's why we, we fear grief so much. Grief is not just sitting with the losses you know about. When you sit with the losses you know about, you have realizations around even deeper losses. So he's already grieving all this stuff when he goes down. And then he realizes on top of it, his mother's passed. All this stuff has happened. His father has been displaced from the palace. So grief adds to grief. Um, which is why one of the many reasons why it's so terrifying. And yet it's necessary. He cannot go home without going into the underworld. There is no other way. Even Athena cannot intervene on his behalf. All right, there, this is the only way. There is no other way. And we see this motif again and again with um, Scylla and Charybdis and the Sire. There is no other way. This is the only way. Um, <laughs> And so, um, and then we come to Tiresias, okay. Tiresias. And I won't get into this too deeply, but Tiresias is his own, it is this, this very rich, very deep and complex symbol in, in Greek uh, mythology. So the backstory, so I talk about inner masculine, inner feminine, how the whole point is that they both need to be reunited and live in harmony, right? And the whole point of the Odyssey is Odysseus is your inner masculine, in this case, uh, is going through this entire Odyssey, going into grief, going through initiation, blah, 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 blah. Going from man to king, right? And then there's a crone, a sage period as well, which we'll talk about but man to king going through this whole midlife. Telemachus is going through this. Odysseus in parallel is going through this. All for what? He doesn't get to be a king again until he's reunited with the proper queen. Not Circe, not Calypso, not Nausicaa, but Penelope. And the action of all of this is so that he can finally get home. So that the inner masculine and inner feminine finally come together. The prince and princess marry live happily ever after. Every fairy tale ends with a wedding. And this is gunning for its own wedding as well. This is re reuniting. Yeah. So how do you do that? When you go into grief, you get wisdom from Tiresias. Who is Tiresias? Tiresias is the ancestral wisdom of the unification of inner masculine and inner feminine. Why is that? The backstory of Tiresias that is not in the Odyssey, it's just elsewhere in Greek, uh, scripture, sacred text, is that Tiresias, before he was this blind uh, prophet, he was walking through the forest one day and saw two snakes copulating. And he took a stick, put it in between the snakes, and instantly he was transformed into a woman. He then lived his life as a woman for eight years. And then at the end of that, so he lived, you know, he's just living life as a woman. He has changed, he's trans, you know, he's changed into a woman. And then at the end of eight years, he was walking through the forest again and saw the two snakes coupling, another two snakes coupling. And he says, oh, that's funny. And he takes his staff and puts it in between the two snakes again. And instantly he's transformed back into a man. Now he's not blind. He doesn't have, you know, uh, seer powers yet. So he's had this experience. Everybody in the Greek pantheon knows he's had this, this experience. One day Zeus and Hera are in Mount Olympus and they're arguing over who enjoys sex more, the man or the woman. And, there, and this is inner masculine, inner feminine arguing about who enjoys sexual union more. And Zeus is like, well, I don't, you know, I don't, I forgot who was on which side of the argument. I think Zeus was saying, oh, no, women enjoy it more. And Hera's like, you know, you pig. All men are pigs. You just think the world of yourself. Men, of course, enjoy it more because they just, you know, abuse us and, like, you know, use us and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So he's like, I know how to settle this. Let's summon Tiresias. He's been a man and a woman, right? So he'll know. Now, of course, this is Greek mythology. It's a patriarchal society. So, you know, take all this with a grain of salt. So they summon Tiresias up and they say, okay, so you've been a man and a woman. Uh, you know, who, who enjoys sex more, the man or a woman? And without hesitating, Tiresias says, the woman, absolutely. Yeah. 
Now he's been both, right? So it's not like he's taking one side or another, but Hera, for whatever reason, is enraged, enraged and on the spot strikes him blind. So he's punished for telling the truth. His, what he sees is the truth. And then he like withdraws and Zeus is like, all right, all right. You know, it's just, maybe he's wrong. Who knows? You know, let's just, let's just, you know, um, let's just make up and, and, and come to bed with me. <laughs> Zeus, right? Zeus. But then afterward he goes to Tiresias and he's like, look, dude, I can't undo Hera's thing, but I can try to make up with it with a boon. And the boon I will give you is the power of prophecy. So your physical eyes are, are blinded, but I will give you the, the opening of the inner eye so that you can see into the future and give prophecy. Uh, I can't undo what Hera's done, but I can try to make up for it a little bit. So, so there you are. So that's how Tiresias ended up being the blind prophet. So he then is in the underworld. He is the one Odysseus has to consult. Why? Because Odysseus himself is trying to affect this reunification of inner masculine and inner feminine. He's trying to get back to Penelope. Yeah. So that's who he needs to talk to. That's why he needs to go into the underworld, into grief, to consult this very deep truth that we hold within ourselves, whatever it is. Yeah. That's why Tiresias is in the Odyssey. Long story short, long story long. And the two things Tiresias says, which is super, oh, is so interesting, mm -hmm. is that he says you need to do two things. The first thing you need to do is you need to land on the island of Helios yeah. and then this winnowing fan. Yeah. And basically, now we're running out of time here, so I'll just say he basically gives him the two keys to get back home here. But when you read into the symbols, he's basically giving you the keys to elder initiation here. Mm. And the reason is, well, one of the things is to get back home here, you need to put the priority of need mm -hmm. and want mm -hmm. aside. You will be starving. There will be beautiful cattle there. You cannot touch them. The cattle belong to Helios, which is the highest, right? The sun, which is the symbol of your desire, your bliss. Mm. So you mustn't let need and want get in the way of you focusing, keeping your eyes on the prize of your desire, your bliss. So in the past, when we talked about the difference between need, want, and desire, this close to home, it is all about desire. You cannot worry about need and want at this point. We've come too far. Right. right. If you're a writer, if you're an artist, now is not the time to worry about like how you're going to figure out some other way to pay your rent. Okay. You're not going to screw up your novel in order to like, you know, write a pot boiler to like make money and pay your rent. Find some other way of doing it. Don't mess with the cattle of your actual artistic voice. Right. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how you get back here. And assuming you've done that successfully, if you haven't, then you're in for it. And he doesn't, the, the men eat the cattle. You know, in the actual story, the men eat the cattle and he's he goes on another circumambulation before he finally gets home. But he does get home as Tiresias uh, predicted. And then this last part of the winnowing fan uh, just has to do with elder initiation. So after you're home, you've defeated the suitors, you're the king again. There's one more thing you have to do, which basically puts you into the crone sage uh, uh, thing, which is this thing that you've had for so long, this ore, uh, is the instrument, this part, so the ore is a part of you too, is the instrument that you used to brute force your way forward on your journey, even when the wind Right, for those of you who have done bliss with me, even though you're Ziran, the natural flow of your bliss was blowing in your face. You use the ego power of your ore to brute force, you know, sort of go upstream against the direction of your bliss to, to be a banker, to be a sort of 
dentist or whatever, something that you didn't like, a lawyer. Um, you brute forced it. Uh, and that's fine. You know, you were just, you know, wearing your mask, trying to sort of get home, whatever, all these things you're doing. Now at the end, you finally hacked your way home and you're the king again. To get to the crone stage, the, the sage stage, um, the elder stage, elder initiation, you need to take that instrument within you of brute force going against the current ego. Go inward. Go inward. Until someone mistakes it for a winnowing fan. When you come to a land where they have never seen the ocean and they have never tasted salt, they get salt from other ways, but they, they never, they, they've never seen salt as, a, as a, its own element. And um, I'll actually read it to you. Um, where people have never heard of the sea and eat their food without salt and are unacquainted with sailing ships and don't even know what an oar is. And this is the unmistakable sign you should look for when on your way, another traveler greets you and says that you have a winnowing fan on your shoulder. Then set your oar in the earth and offer Poseidon, god of the ocean. Poseidon, the sacrifice of a ram, a bull, and a boar. And go back home and sacrifice to the immortals each in turn. Then later, an easy death will come to you from the sea. It will take you gently in your ripe old age. You've made it into elderhood with your people dwelling around you in peace and prosperity. All this, I swear, will happen. Tiresias in the underworld. And the way I've always read this is that in elder initiation, you take all the powers that you had to brute force your way through stuff in life and you go inward until the exact same powers of brute forcing transform into a winnowing fan. What is a winnowing fan? It's the paddle that you put into a pile of harvested wheat, and then you throw the, the grains up into the air so that the wind can blow the chaff, because the chaff is like, you know, just the skin of the wheat, right? So when you go like this and you shovel it up, you put the chaff, the wheat into the air and the wind blows away the chaff and the wheat falls back down. So when you winnowing fan a, a pile of wheat, the chaff blows away and you have the, the ready to use wheat in front of you. And in fairy tales, like in Cinderella, where one of the tasks she has is to pick lentils out of the ashes uh, of, of the hearth, right? And the birds come in and help her pick out the lentils. Ants will come in and other Grimm's fairy tales and help sort of separate things. This motif of separation, of separating the weave from the chaff is typically a symbol of discernment, of judgment, of being able to know like when something is this versus that. And so when your power of youthful and even manly adult brute force becomes softened and transformed, the ore has not changed shape, by the way. The ore is the same. The way you use it is different. Right? And here it's the power of discernment. And the way you're discerning it is very specific. You're throwing the wheat up, right, in order for the wind to do the work of discernment for you. And this is a very specific symbol to me. The ore in the ocean was used to fight against the wind because you wouldn't row if the wind were blowing in your direction. Yeah. You just put up a sail and go. Yeah. So the ore is the force of brute force going against your own inner nature, which is the wind. Yeah. And when you have discernment in the elder phase, you don't paddle anymore, you sail. You use your brute force to throw things up where the wind, which is a symbol of the spirit, right? Intellect, spirit, um, and the wind does the discernment for you. Just like the birds of the air coming in to pick the lentils out for Cinderella, it's exactly the same. Birds are of the air, wind is of the air. It's of the same realm coming in and you having the wisdom to bring that force in. And whatever ego power you have is not to sort of sort it out on the ground, it's to throw it up and let the wind take it. That's when you reach that is a key phase of elder initiation, right? When you're not forcing it. And even because the traveler is a part of you too. So when parts of you realize uh, that's a, they say that's a winnowing fan, that's the part of yourself that you need to go into. 
I mean, there's more to say here, but that's the, and the reason you sacrifice to Poseidon is he's the one that was pissed at you this whole time. But you go back and sacrifice to the god, basically, that you were fighting against before. Because when you're rowing with an oar, you're fighting against Poseidon. Right. And in this phase of life, you're like, well, I have to get from point A to point B. I, this is just my my mask. I'm a merchant. I have to get this grain, you know, to uh, to Rome, to Ostia. Uh, so I, I have no choice. I have to do it. It's fine. You do it. And then when you're in this phase of life, all that brute force gets transformed into judgment and discernment. Um, and you get that wisdom for this later path of elder initiation from midlife going into grief and consulting Tiresias. Tiresias, not Circe, not even Athena. Tiresias is the one they send you to to consult. And he tells you what to do up here in this next phase. Uh, and at the end of the Odyssey, you know, after he kills the suitors, everything's back, he does it. Odysseus does it. He doesn't complain. He doesn't try to trick his way out of it. At this point, he's like, you know, no more tricks. I'm just going to shut up and do what Tiresias told me, which is his own form of wisdom at that point as well. Uh, I think that's all I had to say about that. Gary, do you yeah. have that? Yeah, I mean, just the one observation that I wanted to have your thoughts on is that even as you know, he's, he leaves Calypso's island, Circe's island, there is a kind of a transformation within Odysseus is that until that point, he always relied on his resourcefulness, his cunning, his wit, his trickery to kind of survive and somehow come out of things alive. But from that point onwards, he has kind of surrendered, hasn't he? Mm. He's following instructions. And if he's told to do this, he'll do this. And without any kind of variations of his own in there. But well, he is Odysseus. The men still do eat the cattle of Helios, which is an absolute disaster. So, Odysseus <laughs> yeah, yeah. had warned him already. But, but the journey into the underworld, at least that part, I think he has his, has it on pat. He's like he's just following the instructions and doing. Yeah, let me just put, show it this way. So that part with Tiresias. Yeah. Where you're like, oh my gosh, I've, I'm fine. Like, so you say, how does this apply to my life? I'm finally going into grief. I'm finally doing it. I'm finally finding my Tiresias. This is great. So I'm almost done, right? No, Tiresias right. is like, well, see my bookmark? That's halfway. That's halfway through the Odyssey, babe. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So exactly. if you're like, forget it, it's all over, it's not worth it. And you're sitting there crying, it's like, yeah, you're, 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 you're just on your way to the underworld. You're not quite there yet, all right? Yeah. Uh, and look, you know, some of us don't make it, right? We're like, yeah. I can't, I can't. Um, I'm not trying to say, you know, it's easy or like, you know, uh, buy my little magic box and it'll help it all go. I mean, there is, even Odysseus can't trick his way out of this. I'm just describing a state of affairs that is so. Yeah. Uh, and normalizing it, right? Because it is, this is, this thing is like two and a half thousand years old. So, um, what are, you know? What am I going to say to like soften the blow? You know, but the nice thing is when you see the archetype, when you see the pattern of like, oh, so everyone loses their best years, yeah, yeah, and everyone grieves it, and everyone's like, what's the point of going forward? And they sit there, no oars, no sails. They just sit there crying in the middle of the ocean for like an indefinite amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's about that's about right. Yeah. I mean, part of the task is of initiation, like Tiresias, like mentor telling and Athena telling uh, Nestor telling uh, Telemachus what to do. Mm -hmm. When you open yourself up again, this is all in sacred space. When yeah. you find sacred space, you know, like whether from us reading random stories that the muse feeds us to give to you, or you just getting downloads on your own when you're in sacred space, or in, on your own meditation, going for a run, whatever. That's the juice. That's when it hits you. And you get the full download and you get clarity of like, oh, you know, I have all these jerks in my life. They're like bullying me. But the larger picture is like, shit, the message is this. Yeah. Okay, I get it. And I don't even worry that the jerks are still like hurt. It's like at the end of the first Matrix movie, when mm -hmm. Neo sees everything around him, the mm -hmm. bad guys are still shooting bullets at them, but he has the power to stop them. And he's like fighting them with one arm or whatever. 
Yeah. It's not that the physics of the thing has changed. His vision is what has changed. Yeah. He sees past it and that gives him power. Yeah. Right. So here, once Odysseus gets the download from Tiresias, mm -hmm. he still suffers the second half of the Odyssey. He still yeah. goes through all that suffering, but it's different because he's like, he's got a, there's a pattern he's sewing to now. And that makes it better. I mean, I mean, von Franz, Viktor Frankl said something like this, basically the message of, you know, almost any suffering is more bearable when you know the meaning of it, when you see the larger pattern of which is a part. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and I say, they didn't say almost, they said every suffering. I say okay. almost because I want to, I want to give a little room for, for you to say, but no, but, but I'm different. And I, I want to give you room for that because we're in sacred space. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. I mean, after all, Tiresias just gives him a map and says, this is what's going to happen. You do this or this, and this is how you end up. So overall, it's like a map and he knows what's coming. So he kind of knows when he used to push again. So, yeah. Awesome. Anything else? Should we? Yeah, I think that's that's my observation and question. So my but only, can, yeah. We can have them uh, come up for the next session, right? If anyone has questions. Yes, yes. If you have any questions, put them in chat in the question area on Facebook comments. We'll find them and, and pull them together. Yeah. So then before we close, I'll just say uh, the exercise for this week between now and the next session, if it isn't obvious, right, is, um, thanks, Gary, uh, is to reflect, given everything we've talked about, where are you in your life, right? Uh, and what does all this mean for you in terms of expectation setting and what transformation are you going through, right? Are you at initiation? Are you at midlife initiation? Are you at elder initiation? Um, and... For me, the reason that's helpful to think about is that, you know, there are pains and grieves that you go through, grieving that you go through, through any of these phases of life. And when we talked about like female initiation and how it's punctuated by these, you know, physical aspects of like menstruation and childbirth and then uh, menopause, right? Uh, you know, I don't need to like, this is, I'm just kind of, belaboring the obvious when I say that, oh, these three beautiful life-giving trans, there is no life without menstruation and uh, and childbirth, obviously, and menopause. Um, these are not pleasant. <laughs> these are not like painless, right? Uh, and men have their own similar kinds of thing, not at the same magnitude, obviously. Uh, but the thing is like, when you realize it's a transformation, it helps you see it as a transformation and not as any other thing like punishment, right? Uh, like the Adam and Eve, Genesis, patriarchal, Judeo-Christian, oh, women have pain in childbirth because it's a punishment that was given to Eve. It's not, it's a transformation. Or you take the shamey patriarchal lens off it and it's this transformation uh, that's beautiful and painful. And the pain itself is like, I mean, it's small comfort, right? But it's part of this beautiful pattern. So another question to ask, to consider is, are you in the current phase of life? What transformation are you going through? What are the expectations of anyone, not just you, any human going through a tran the transformation you're going through now? And given those reasonable expectations, do you find that you may be beating yourself up for a phase of transformation that is not actually measured in failure or success, but just a natural part of your normal life cycle as a person? It's like what we said about the pandemic like three months ago at the very first session, like 17 sessions ago. You know, is the pandemic a punishment or a transformation? You could see it as either. I incline toward the view that it's a transformation. Seeing the phases, right, when I've worked with people, tends to relax the anxiety of the what we call the inner bully. So you just relax and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going through midlife initiation. It's painful as hell. Uh, but I'm basically on schedule. And even if I'm behind schedule and, you know, other people have lost only 20 years, but I've lost 27 years, right? <laughs> it's like everyone's transformation is different. So no big emergency. Then I see the, the pattern. I see the archetype and I can just relax. I'm like, oh, I'm in the archetype. I'm in the pattern. Got it. So then given that, it's not just relief and freedom from shame. 
it's also, oh, well, let, let's look to the pattern then. What, what is going to happen next? Can I see around corners now? Right? You, you relax and you're like, okay, I'm in the pattern. And then you're like, ah, right. Well, then what do we have next? Let's continue looking at the rest of the pattern. We can even read the Odyssey to read the next of the pattern. Um, if you're in the Telemachus phase, reading the Odyssey just gave you the pattern for midlife initiation and even elder initiation when you get to that point. Uh, that's the beauty of these myths and archetypes. They are time tested. They filtered, they've survived millenniums to get to you. Uh, and they're like instruction manuals. So you can say, oh, what's next now? What do we have? What will we, what will we like? We will get to a point where we have a choice. What would I like to choose and why? Like that, that kind of feeling, that kind of feeling. So that's the exercise. Just think about that, post any questions you have, uh, and we can nerd out on those in, in a future session. All right, so it's 12.06. Uh, uh, that's all we had. Sorry it ran long, but um, uh, but that's it. So we'll we'll go ahead and close sacred space now. I hope that was uh, at least entertaining, if not uh, maybe a little bit helpful. Uh, and I'll go ahead and close the session now. So the next session is next Sunday. As always, it's freed up and open to everyone. Please invite other people. Go ahead and ask uh, questions, and we'll have a Q&A session at some point. Uh, and you can sign up for the next session right there on your uh, green button in your panel on Crowdcast. Uh, there should be a link somewhere in the Facebook post as well. Uh, and so now I will go ahead and uh, close our session uh, for this week. I hereby close the session of our shared sacred space. Thank you for holding this space with me. And thank you for sharing the nourishment, the emotional nourishment, the spiritual nourishment, of the shared sacred space with me and us. I give you my blessing. Go in peace, bestowed with blessing, free of fear, free of threat, and free of the undue control of others. Have a great day, have a great week, and I will see you all in the next session. Thank you. Thank you.